This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is a brilliant songwriter and guitarist whose musical partnership with vocalist extraordinaire Russell Hitchcock created one of the most iconic and beloved rock bands in the history of popular music, better known as Air Supply. Like everyone else, I have loved their music from day one, and from the day we started this show, it has been my dream to interview this man who wrote almost all of the songs that form such a huge part of the soundtrack of our lives. Here he is, the one that you love, multi-million selling, multi-platinum recording artist, Graham Russell. Graham, thank you so much for joining us. Harvey, what a great in introduction. Thank you. I'll have to live up to that. It's a pleasure being here, by the way. It really is. Thank you. Well, Graham, you know, there are songwriters who've been able to write a few songs that made it big. And then there are the songwriters like Cole Porter, Elton John, Carole King, Lennon and McCartney, who achieve legendary status because of the sheer volume of musical magnificence that they create. And you, sir, are a legend. It is a huge honor to have you on our show. Oh, my God. I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. You know, I don't consider myself in that kind of company, but you're very kind anyway. Thank you. Graham, you still perform about 130 concerts a year, except during a pandemic, of course. Mm -hmm. I've had the thrill of seeing you in concert many times, and I consider myself a proud airhead, which is what we fans call ourselves. <laughs> your concerts are incredibly emotional experiences for your fans because there's such love for you and your music. Can you describe the feeling of having that much love pouring out at you on the stage every night? Well, it it's, it's the main reason why we just love to play live, you know. I mean, there are other aspects of the show business that uh, we can that we enjoy, but playing live is the, is the greatest thrill, certainly for me. It's that so what connection with the audience, you know, and when you bear your soul to them, they respond. And, you know, nothing's fake, everything's real. And it's just a night of passion and emotion that you can't, you can't buy that anywhere. It's just a great thing. And I feel very privileged to be able to do that most nights when we're in a normal situation, you know. Can you ever get tired of that kind of adulation? I mean, you do so many shows. You've been doing it for so many years. You don't get tired of it, no. You know, Russell and I said many years ago, we would stop playing when the people stopped coming. And that's not happened. And I, I can't see that happening for a while. No. But it, it's just part of the whole of, of our lives now, you know. And uh, one day, one show, one day will be our last show. And uh, sometimes I think about that. And that will be a sad moment. But it's not on the horizon anytime soon, you know. No, please. And to anyone who hasn't yet seen Air Supply in concert, I want you to take notice that in my introduction, I described them as a rock band because that's what they are. Graham, it actually offends me when I hear people use the term soft rock to describe your music because anyone who's seen you perform knows that you are quite simply a rock band. We are, we always have been, you know, the only thing is that we play, you know, we have a lot of our big hits are big epic ballads and we play those. But nevertheless, those are performed with incredible passion and it's loud. And those those electric guitars are buzzing, you know. So uh, people are always very surprised when they come and see us afterwards. And they say, wow, I had no idea, you know. And we say, well, we told you, you know. Let me take you back to 1980. You signed a recording contract at Arista Records with legendary music executive Clive Davis. He had such an amazing ear for talent. Can you share some memories of working with him? I can. The first time I had a conversation with Clive, I was in Cannes in the south of France and I was broke. I was trying to sell songs at this mid M publishing festival. But when I got there, unfortunately, I got food poisoning. So I missed the whole festival. But I walked down the street and I saw a copy of Billboard and on the front cover, it said Air Supply, not Air Supply, it said Lost in Love, destined to be top five. And uh, my immediate thought was that somebody recorded a song called Lost in Love, not mine, but another one. And I thought, oh, that figures, you know. 
And it said, turn to page five. So I did. And there was a picture of Russell and I on page five. Then I knew that we were in business. And But I, I didn't know what to do. So I called Clive and I reversed the charges. He was in New York. And we had our first conversation. And I said, okay, what's going on? Because we didn't know that Lost in Love had been released in the US at all. And he said, oh, yeah. And he said, it's going to go all the way. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, where are you? And I said, well, I'm in Europe at the moment. And he said, you better get back to Australia and get that album because you're going to need it, you know. And that was the beginning of a great relationship with, with Clive. But he always told you how he felt. And I remember listening back to the one that you love, the final mix. And that was a very, not a strange moment. It was a very important moment because... Uh, it was our second album. We'd had three top fives. So this was like, this was the tale of the tape here. We had to impress him, you know. A lot of artists have a first album and then you don't hear of them again. And we didn't want to be one of those. And he was in the studio and he was sitting right at the console on, on his own. And we were all behind him. And he listened back to the final mix of the one that you love. And we were like going, oh God, I hope he likes it. And after it was finished, he didn't say anything for like two minutes. And that's that's an eternity. And then he turned around to us and he said, it's going to go to number one and it'll win you a Grammy. And we were like, oh, <laughs> because whatever he said always happened. And it was uncanny. And we used to think at that time, because we were kind of new in the business, really, we used to say he can't be right all the time. He, he has to. He has to stumble. He's got to. But you know what? In our in our career, he never did. And in the end, you just have to go along with him and say, "Well, he did it again." You know, he, he was and still is a legend. You know, and now after all these years, I look back and because we worked with him so closely, it was such a privilege to to do that because not many artists get to do that. But he was incredibly instrumental in our career. Absolutely. And he was very blessed that you came into his life. Your first single, Lost in Love, was the fastest selling hit single in the world. Lost in love, I don't know much. Wasn't thinking aloud, fell out of touch. But I'm back on my feet and eager to be what you want. To. And then your second single, All Out of Love, went up the charts even quicker. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. I know you were right. Believing for so long. I'm all out of love. What am I without you? I can't be too late to say that I was so But it's yeah. easy to forget that you and Russell spent five years struggling in Australia before making it big. You were not an overnight success, were you? We weren't, far from it. You're correct, Harvey. We were together for five years before that. And in Australia, when we first came out in 70, 76, we had success straight away, but then we had nowhere to go in Australia. Then we opened for Rod Stewart in in North America and went back to Australia feeling like heroes, but we had to start again. They'd forgotten about us. And it was a tough time, but we learned resilience and we got up again and we fought back. And it ended up with, uh, I went away and wrote a lot of songs and Lost in Love and All Out of Love were two of them. So when we came back in 1980, we were ready for it, you know, but it, in Australia in the early years, in those five years, we were playing in pubs and clubs and they were raucous places, you know, but it was a great, it was a great training for us. You know, it was a great character building experience. I mean, we would come out on stage, uh, everybody would be dancing on the floor, then we'd come out and play and everybody would sit down. And I remember one show in Sydney we played and nobody came at all. And, you know, in those days, we did two set, two one-hour sets. And the, the manager of the place, after the first set, said, you can go home, I'll give you half the money, which was very little anyway. And we said, no, 
we're going to play the whole sh- we're going to play another set and you give us all the money but nobody came nobody and it was kind of soul destroying you know you're, you're standing there on stage playing these songs and there's nobody in the audience and but you know instead of a lot of artists i think would have given up said oh it's over but we didn't we we just fought back and we stuck it out because we wanted to come back to the us you know we really did i think that the fact that you remember that experience so vividly explains to your fans why you appreciate us so much when you're standing in front of a packed house every night that's so true i mean we've been at the bottom of the bottom of the barrel you know uh, a few times so now you know when we first came to the us with success in 1980 and saw all these people we thought okay we're never going to let anything else happen to us again and we haven't you know we, and we have great respect for our fans we've always done meet and greets even before they were popular and uh, i think because of that the fans are very loyal and they love the experience that we have together the audience and us when we play you know is it true that in the early years at one point you and Russell were so poor that you were looking for loose change behind sofas in hotel rooms so you could buy food Oh, absolutely yeah i mean we would tr- you could always find change in sofas in hotel rooms or wherever you are people are always dropping small change out of their pockets and we used to find it and we'd go and find a loaf of bread and we'd go and toast it and that's what we used to eat you know i mean but those times now they seem quite ridiculous but they're true and i know a lot of artists go through similar things because that's what you do you know you we call it getting in the trenches and you've got to learn your craft and you've got to you've got to have nothing and then everything you get if you've got nothing is everything and that's how you learn learn to live and you learn appreciation of everything you know well one thing is for sure once you had a big hit there was no stopping you air supply had seven consecutive top 5 singles which matched the Beatles run of top 5 hits i think there's something karmic about that graham because the beatles were one of your strongest musical influences weren't they oh the strongest yeah and and that is true what you just said but but when people say that it's like it's somebody else because i'm such a big beatles fan to be mentioned in the same sentence as as they is like the biggest thrill of our career you know so that was quite a thrill for us and uh, it's amazing i love the fact that after 45 years you're still in awe of what's happened to you you still feel <laughs> fresh you have never become jaded or arrogant and you don't take anything for granted it's it's very refreshing and i i commend you for that oh you're very kind harvey thank you Well you know Russell comes from a very poor background where he came from in Melbourne his family never had anything my family were the same uh we never had a car we never had a phone i remember when i was 9 years old we had a black and white tv that was like about 9 inches the screen was about 9 inches and we all used to crowd around it to watch the bbc so growing up our background was very similar even though we lived in different countries but we never had anything but what we did have was family that we were very close to and that became everything you know it's living in england in those days a working class family a working class background was was great for us it built character and you know the they are the things that you just don't forget you know Well, I'm going to take you to another surreal moment. In 1988, you performed at Australia's bicentennial celebration in front of Prince Charles and Princess Diana. Did you get to meet them? We did. We met them in the line and both Russell and I spoke with both of them for about 2 minutes, but then the next day we were lucky enough in lucky enough to have lunch with them. We were asked to have lunch. Russell couldn't make it. I think he was seeing his family. And so I had lunch with Prince Charles and uh, Princess Diana and it was quite surreal. We spoke not a lot but it was weird when you do speak to them in that instance the future king of England is talking to you like 
you know, oh, did you go shopping today? What, ha- what, where, what have you been doing and all that? And I'm, I'm replying and it, this is the future King of England. It's like really weird, you know. <laughs> I can only imagine, kind of like how I feel talking to you. All right. <laughs> I must say, if I may, speaking to Princess Diana, she was probably the most beautiful soul I've ever had the pleasure to meet. She was just something else. There was something about her that was otherworldly. It really, really, she was just, she was the ultimate princess. And not that I, that's the only one I've ever met, but she was so kind and so beautiful. Her inner being just shone like a brightest light. It was amazing. I think you probably tuned into her sincerity. Yes, she, she was. And, you know, she was always very shy. In the press, she's always appears very shy. And that's who she was. She was very shy. But she had things to say. And she said to, she said, you know, I have your, I have your, I have the one that you love album. And I said, really? She said, yeah. She said, I love that album. She said, I love the one that you love. And I went, I was like, whoa. <laughs> Amazing. I was very touched by your Vanishing Race album, released in 1993, because it was dedicated to the plight of the North American Indians. Can you tell us how the concept for that album was conceived? Well, I was working on the songs, and then suddenly this song, The Vanishing Race, came along. Actually, the actual riff came from the bass player in the band at the time, and he was just playing it. And I said, what's that? And he said, oh, it's just a riff I've been playing. And I said, can I use that? Can I turn that into a song? Which I did. And I thought the the Vanishing Race, the title itself, was a great phrase because it has two meanings, obviously. At that time, I was reading this incredible book all about the Native American Indians. And it was the the Bible on, uh, on American Indians. And I read it from cover to cover and I was really taken by it. And I think there was a picture of a, a Navajo chief on his horse. And I think underneath it, it said something like the vanishing race. I, so it wasn't my idea, but I got those words and I just took it and I was so into it. And I thought nobody's really written an album about the American, North American Indians. And so I, th- I said, it's time. So the whole album was dedicated to that. I also got in touch with an American Indian called Quiltman, and I spoke to him, and he was a big uh, American Indian advocate for human rights, etc. And we became friends, and he came to the sessions. And on the Vanishing Race, on the actual track, it's him singing at the end, and he sings this, he chants, and it was so inspiring. And I remember when we recorded it, he said, Can I turn all the lights off in the studio? And we played the track really loud and the drums were going. And then he started to chant and he was chanting for about five minutes. And it, not all of it is on the track, but it was, it was so incredible. It was one of the most amazing recording moments of my career. It was just a great moment. That whole vanishing race time was wonderful, you know. It really comes through on the album. You know, Air Supply was the first Western band to tour China and one of the first invited to perform in Cuba in front of an audience of 175,000 people. That was in 2005. And then when the second show was canceled because of a hurricane, you gave an acoustic performance at the hotel because there was no power. You must have some really unique memories from that trip. I do. That whole trip was like a, a movie. It was like an Andy Warhol movie because we knew the, cy- the cyclone was, was coming in, but we thought we'd be safe. And we had two shows booked and the first one, we got there for sound check at four in the afternoon and they said, well, it's going to rain for a while because this weather is coming in. And so we said, OK, well, we'll stick it out. We didn't go on till two in the morning and we were backstage that whole time. We couldn't sound check because the rain was torrential and the wind was out of this world. And they said, well, the rain's going to stop about about one, between one and two in the morning. And we said, well, nobody's going to stay. 
about six o'clock, the people started to come. And he said, I'm expecting about 50,000 people. And it was right in the center of Cuba. They shut the city down. And the promoter came, came backstage every half an hour. And he said, there's so many people. He said, they keep coming. And he said, he's, he came back. He said, there's 100,000. Then he said, there's 150,000. Then he said, there's about 175,000 people. And everybody stayed till two in the morning. And we went out and played. And after we played, the rain came in and this hurricane devastated Cuba. When we went back to the hotel, the hotel lobby was full of hundreds of people lying on the floor. They had nowhere to go. And uh, it was a famous hotel. And I, I said to the, the manager of the hotel, I said, I've got to do something, you know. And he said, well, we, there was no, no power. They had candles and plenty of food and water. There was no power anywhere in the building. And I said, can I play? Uh, uh, and I said, what will happen if I go into the restaurant? They had a big grand piano in the, and play. And he said, I don't know. So I made an announcement. I went in the center of the lobby and I said, uh, hey, everybody, you know, I'm from Air Supply. I'm going to play a few songs over there on the piano. If, if you'd like to come and listen, come. And I went in and I started and all these people, like three or 400 people followed me. They all sat down around the piano and I played for like 45 minutes and it was incredible. <laughs> Graham, you co-wrote I Can Wait Forever with David Foster, and the song was featured in the movie Ghostbusters. And yeah. I think he co-wrote the song Goodbye from your Vanishing Race album. And of That's course, great. Making Love Out of Nothing at All was written by Jim Steinman. But am I right yeah. that almost all of Air Supply's hit songs were written by you? That's correct, yes, with those few exceptions. But that wasn't by design really you know my main function is that i'm a songwriter that sings russell is a lead singer and i'm very fortunate because i write all the time so i've always got a cachet of songs at any moment when we go to record i've usually got 20 or 25 songs to pick from but nevertheless it was great working with jim and it was great working with david foster because they're both legendary you know uh both incredible pianists and uh plus we wanted to work with as many great people as we could you know and both of those were it was incredible jim steinman and and david were amazing i want to ask you about the song son of the father it's just beautiful what inspired oh. you to write that song well about 10 years ago people used to hire me to write musicals and so I wrote a few musicals and some of them are still in production but that was a song from one of those musicals but I you know whatever song I write if it's for a musical project or an air supply album I always want the song to stand on its own two feet I don't want to have to make excuses for it and with Son of the Father I thought I'm going to play this song uh, live during the air supply show Russell takes a break for five or six minutes and I get to do whatever I want. And I play, I usually play a new song or a song that I think they might enjoy. And I, one night I played Son of the Father and uh, it really, it was about a son and his father. They never knew each other. The father died before the son was born. And so I thought, you know, that, that's a great story for a song. And people really responded to it. Uh, like a lot and so I ended up keeping it in my in the, my little set for like six months and it funnily enough I haven't thought about that song for a long time so I'm glad you mentioned it but it did get great reaction it really did oh yeah I'm one of those people that reacted when I was researching your background I discovered that you taught yourself to play guitar Graham that's just astounding well thank you but when I where I grew up in the middle in the center of England I come from Nottingham it's a very working class uh, town. It's a coal mining town. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was end up going, working down the mine after I left school. But I did teach myself guitar. I don't know why I just picked it up, but I just did. And 
But the, I had a slight problem with it because I'm left-handed. And when I picked up the guitar, I picked it up the wrong way. So all the chords that I play now are backwards. So I had to learn it. I learned everything the wrong way. And I, I don't play the right way, by the way. I just play everything backwards. And looking at chords in a book, which I learned, I thought, wow, that's a strange chord. And I, I learned everything the wrong way. But it was too late to correct it. So now that what it did do, when I play the guitar, because I, I love the 12 string, when I play it backwards, it gives us this unique sound. If you listen to the beginning of Lost in Love and the beginning of All Out of Love, which are guitar intros, it's very hard to replicate it because it's backwards. And it, it gives it that kind of sound, you know. But when, when I play the beginnings of those, either of those songs, you know what it is. It's kind of that thing. But I did learn, learn, teach myself because there was nobody else to teach me. You know, I learned every chord that I could learn. So I know, I know most chords, but then I started to create my own chords, which I could do because I'm playing it backwards. It's very strange, but I, I learned my, I created my own chords. It's absolutely remarkable. Last year on May 12th, 2020, to be exact, Air Supply celebrated its 45th anniversary and you performed your 5,000th concert in Las Vegas. It's well known and actually quite amazing that you and Russell Hitchcock have never had a falling out in all those years when so many other bands have broken up. What's the secret to the longevity of such a harmonious partnership? It is, and it always has been. I think the secret is the fact that Russell just wants to sing, and really I just want to write the songs. As I said earlier, I'm a songwriter that sings, and Russell is the lead singer. Russell doesn't like to get involved in a lot of the day-to-day -day activities of the band but i like that i like creating the albums and writing the songs and and it's a great partnership for that reason he doesn't want to he doesn't come to me and say oh i've got this song i want to record it so that's my my job in the band and his job is to sing and so we keep those two roles they're very separate and we're not treading on each other's toes. So it allows me to do what I want fully without any boundaries. You know? Well, Graham, I think it's actually more than that. I think it's maturity. Any time I've seen the two of you interviewed, I can sense a deep mutual respect and admiration for each other and a maturity about how to conduct a successful career in this business. That's really rare. Well, thank you very much. I think part of that, is because when we first achieved success uh, around the world in 1980, we were already 25 years old and 26 years old. Russell's a year older than me. So we were past that, that teen uh, rage, if you like, uh, not that we had any, but we were very responsible and we, we had some success in Australia, but then we'd been brought down to earth so we wanted it and we didn't want anything to get in the way. So we were responsible and we looked at our career and said, okay, what do we want to achieve? When we, we left Australia, or we had the opportunity to go to, to the US to open for Rod, our producer at the time in Australia said, you know, if, if you stay here and don't go to tour with Rod, you, you'll be the biggest band in Australia. And our reply was, and we said straight back to him, we said, we don't want to be the biggest band in Australia. We want to be the biggest band in the world. And he looked at us and he was like dumbfounded. He went, whoa. And of course he thought we would never achieve that, but we kind of came close for a little while in the early eighties, you know. I think most people would say that you did achieve it. <laughs> well, yeah. there, are, there, are, there are a lot of bands and there were a lot of bands around when we were there, but. Actually, the bands that we did come across in those early years, we, it was a great camaraderie and we met a lot of them and great people, especially in those times. You know. Your latest album is entitled The Lost in Love Experience, recorded with yeah. the Prague Symphony. Graham, mm -hmm. the combination of the majestic songs, Russell's soaring lead vocals, and that beautiful symphony orchestra is just amazing. Congratulations on such a beautiful album. I just love it. Oh, thank you. It, it's my fa favorite album of ours. 
And it happened by a strange circumstance. We were in Las Vegas and it, uh, there was an English gentleman that came backstage, it was a fan, and he was on vacation. And he said, God, I love your songs. And he said, have you ever thought of doing an orchestral album? And I said, you know, we have, we'd like to do that if the opportunity arose. And he said that he worked with the Prague Symphony. And I knew that they were the one of, they were one of the most famous uh, orchestras in Europe. And I said, wow, really? My ears pricked up. And he said, yeah, and, you know, I, I can let you know if they have a break or have a, because they're booked all the time. He said, if they have a break, I can let you know. And he called me and he said, they have a, a hiatus, but they're willing to come in if you want to record with them. And I said, yeah. So we went over there and it was incredible. The studio where they work, and they only work in this one studio in Prague, was this, the sound stage where Lawrence of Arabia was recorded. And that's one of my favorite soundtracks and one of my favorite movies ever. And uh, all these great songs were recorded there. And it was an old, old building from the 30s. But when you walked in, you just feel this spirit of everything that's happened there. And it was such a great experience. I, I think the album is our finest, I really do. It was a great marriage of these epic songs with this epic orchestra, and they loved it too. And a lot of the players were like in their 70s and 80s, you know, and, but they were incredible. Their tone and their, their playing was out of this world. Oh, it really was. It is absolutely my favorite of all of your albums and my favorite oh. song on the album is i adore you i think a lot of oh. your fans feel the same way i love i adore you oh thank you i, I wrote that song in, in south america about seven or eight years ago just in in an afternoon i was in the room and it was before sound check i wrote the song in about half an hour which is kind of normal for me and i thought wow i can't wait to get back after the show because I, I, I rec if I'm in my hotel room I record everything on my phone and I thought I'm not going to listen to it until after the show that night and I, I was so excited because I thought in the afternoon that it was a, a good song and I came back and I thought oh god I hope it's as good as I think it is and I played it and I went yes and, and I, for me it was and it's become it's in our show now permanently it's become it wasn't a hit song for us, but it is, it's a hit with all the fans and they just love it. Yeah, but thank you. Oh, you're welcome. In 2018, a musical based on your songs was performed in the Philippines and you wrote a song called I Was In Love With You for yeah. that show. Is there any chance that the show will come to North America? I know that they're thinking about it. They're revising the book now, but it, it was a, a great thrill that whole experience because I, I love musical theater and uh, we, Russell and I went there to watch it we watched the rehearsals and we we stayed there for about a week I think and it ran for quite some time and it was a great show and everybody was saying well you got to bring it to to the west you know and I think they're still working on that and I hope that they do but I did write that song they asked me to write a new song for it which I did uh, I really hope it comes to North America. I will be there on opening night, believe me. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. I'm sure you will. <laughs> now, Graham, you're really an amazing person, quite apart from the music. You live on a farm in Utah. You grow your own food. You've been writing poetry since you were 11 years old. You wrote a book of poetry called Turn Left at Greenland. Mm. And at one of the concerts I attended, you recited your poem, I Am, which brought me to tears, actually. Is there any chance you could recite even a little of it for us? Oh, I, I think so, if I can remember it, but I will. I can't, I can't believe you know all this, uh, these facts, Harvey, it's blowing me away. <laughs> let, let, me see, let me see if I can, if I can remember it, and I'm sure I can. Let me just get my brain around it. Am I the pebble lying in the stream, or the water freed from melting snow? Am I the dream of sleepless dream? that has no home, nowhere to go? Am I the thought to build a bridge between two points of view? I am at least one thing I know, a solitary monument that always longs for you. 
Am I the quiver of a desert flower or the roots that lie in sacred ground? Am I trapped in my ivory tower until the day I knock it down? Am I the curious dragonfly of orange, red and blue? I am at least one thing I know, a solitary monument that always longs for you. No words. <laughs> oh, thank you. You really get me. You know, Graham, it's really clear that poetry and your songs are a huge emotional outlet for you. Am I right? Yeah, it, it really is. I don't know how I could survive without either of them. You know, it's, you know, I spend a lot of time where my mind wanders about things. And uh, this is a great place for me with poetry and songs. I can, I can pinpoint something or if, you know, if I see something, even if I see a, a, a tree, like I'm looking at now waving in the breeze, it, it brings images to me and words come that reflect that image and uh, it, it's a great it's a great gift that i that i have that uh, i don't know why it should happen to me it should have happened to uh, millions of other people but i'm so thankful for it it's it's a great gift that i treasure every moment i really do what a blessing you are you know graham it's it, it, first of all thank you again for for reading the poem i will always remember that graham russell recited a poem just to me and that's the first time I've ever done that, certainly on Zoom, but, but to anyone, to be quite honest. But I'm thank very, you very honored, Graham. You know, it's, it's easy to talk about the tens of millions of albums you've sold and the thousands of concerts and all of the accolades and the awards that Air Supply has received. But for me and your millions of fans, it all comes down to one thing, the music. Those spectacular, yeah. powerful songs that evoke so much emotion and so much joy. I only have one more question for you. Do you get, I mean, really deep down inside, do you get how incredibly talented you and Russell are and how beloved you are? Uh, you know, I try not to, to go down that, that road because I, I always believe that bo both of us are very ordinary people coming from, as I said earlier, working class backgrounds. And I, I really believe this. It, it could have happened to any a million of other other people but it didn't and sometimes i think why did it happen why did it happen to us and uh, and i don't know the answer but uh, you know i i respect what we do and uh, and i love being able to write poetry and write songs without it as i said earlier i don't know what i would do because a normal life wasn't meant for me and but i treasure every second of it you know and i you were right you said this interview would be the best i've ever done and you're absolutely right it's so very very emotional and i want to thank you for everything Holly. i really do it was fantastic thank you i, I really loved it it was great oh graham uh, that means so much to me i thank you with all my heart for taking the time to come on our show and reminisce with me about your monumental career. I'm so grateful to you, Graham. And, and I have to give a special shout out to your publicist, Steve Levesque. He moved yeah. heaven and earth to schedule this interview on short notice. So thank you, Steve. I owe you one. You have been a highlight of my life. Uh, your oh my music, God, thank you. Your music plays in our home all the time and in my car. And getting the chance to speak with you about your life, your career, uh, just meant the world to me. Thank you for taking the time to do this. Harvey, it's my greatest pleasure. I've really enjoyed this. I really have. It's fantastic. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. And when you come to a show next time, come and say hi. I would love to. Yeah. Our guest has been superstar songwriter and musician Graham Russell from everybody's favorite band, Air Supply. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.